what I specifically want to talk to you about this afternoon is connecting properly with the environments within which we live. Uh, and I believe, and, and in many ways, the lockdown uh, in Britain and in other countries that we've all experienced uh, since the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic has only sharpened my conviction that um, the most expansive uh, engagement with place and space uh, that we can have uh, consists in re-engaging with what is right in front of us and around us. Um, for about 10 years now, I've been teaching a course called Psychogeography uh, at Brunel University. Before that, for some years, I, I wrote a weekly newspaper column in, in The Independent called Psychogeography. Uh, I think it's it's become a term that people think they understand and, and think they know about, but perhaps it needs uh, a little bit of a clarification in order for me to get across to you how I believe the practice of psychogeography, uh, and it is a practice, it's not really an academic field, uh, can assist you, not in a kind of low-level, touchy-feely, mindfulness way. Uh, I'm not interested in trying to, you know, I, I tend to, to follow the, the great Russian writer's view, uh, Turgenev's view, when he talked about Eastern mysticism and, and said, what's the difference between a white void and a black void, which is not to knock Eastern mysticism. Uh, it's just that I'm not concerned to help people to, in some way, zone out or uh, lose a sense of their individuality and their subjectivity altogether. What I'm much more interested in, and I concede this does bear some relationships to kind of modish mindfulness, is an intense actualization of subjectivity followed by its release. And in that act, kind of the, as it were, existential act of the abandonment of subjectivity to paradoxically experience one's freedom in a world that it seems increasingly chaotic uh, and uh, to, to, to offer little wiggle room for genuine autonomy uh, for all sorts of reasons and for all sorts of people. So psychogeography, Guy Debord, the French situationist, uh, said that the, the, the term was uh, formulated by uh, an illiterate Kabyle or, or North African, a somewhat uh, tendentious observation. Uh, but at any rate, it, it became current in, in uh, these kind of art revolutionary circles in the Paris of uh, the mid to late 1950s and then into the 1960s. And uh, psychogeography uh, was, was viewed by these people who were Marxists of a sort, though rather heterodox, as a minute examination of the effects of place and space on the psyche, a kind of attunement to place and space. Uh, in this, they were following André Breton's surrealist group, who, you know, also had ideas about the great value of a certain kind of, <laughs> if you like, uh, conscientized flannery, a certain kind of wandering through urban spaces and places that is uh, informed by a certain kind of sensibility. Following on from the Surrealists, the Situationists took up this idea of Flannery, which in its way goes back to, to Baudelaire and his great essay, The Painter of Modern Life, and to the kind of Paris arcades of, of the uh, 1820s and 30s, and enlarged it into a kind of philosophy of life, a kind of philosophy of, of radical autonomy. For the Situationists, the technique they were happiest to employ uh, was what they called the derive or drift. And so the idea of the derive or drift is simply that you abandon your normal preoccupations, your kind of, you, you give up trying to work life balance, uh, and you simply move forward uh, into life. Uh, into into the environment without some kind of calculation of, of what I tend to to say to my students is a kind of metric formulated by time and money and and I think under in the kind of uh, environments and, and economies within which we live and work 
A great problem is that all of our journeys, at least heretofore, up until, up until the pandemic, uh, involved just such a calculation. Really, every one of us is like a kind of little cab driver who is, um, you know, got a meter internal to your psyche that is constantly calculating the time involved from get to, getting from A to B, the money involved, and whether the journey is worthwhile. And I'd say this applies even to kind of leisure travel or visiting friends or relations. It all becomes factored into the overall metric of time and money. So the derive is to chuck out that onboard meter we're all suffering from uh, and instead to try in as far as it's possible, and I think this is the very essence of the derive, to move through the environment with no preconceptions, no destinations. It is the true idea that it's about the journey, uh, not what's at the end of it. It's actually surprisingly hard to do for people, uh, to decouple in that way. We think we can do it, uh, but we find it incredibly hard. You know, one of the things, that, of course, I have to say to students from the get-go is, you're not going to be looking at your phone. You're certainly not going to be consulting the uh, GPS navigation program on your phone. The great problem with that, of course, is that it's almost antithetical to what I want to talk about. GPS gives you absolute location, but no orientation whatsoever. It reduces everything to the compass of your screen. Uh, and, of course, since the inception of uh, fully bi-directional digital media in the early 2000s, you've increasingly seen people wandering around cities who, uh, you know, are just looking at, at the screen in front of them as if it were a, a breviary or a psalter of some kind and they were adepts of some strange religion. So, you know, you've got to leave the mobile phone at home uh, and you've got to abandon the idea of a destination and you have to move through the environment being drawn by inclinations, what looks interesting, uh, what leads you on, where have you never been before, uh, is there a chance encounter that will divert you from your route? And, and, and again, you know, you might think, oh, well, that sounds fairly easy to do, but, but it, it's surprisingly difficult. If you like, it's a kind of free association of place and space. It's a kind of engagement with the environment that is predicated on treating places and spaces as if they were a kind of repressed content that comes to the surface uh, of your psyche. And it sort of puts me in mind, actually, of my late mentor, J.G. Ballard, and his novel Crash, in which he tried to create an environment that was the inversion of the latent and the manifest in the idea of the Freudian dream content. So for Freud, there's the manifest content of the dream. You know, I was eating an enormous marshmallow and then I was sick. And then there's the latent content. It's to do with your castration anxiety or your whatever it is. It's to do with some buried complex. Ballard inverts that for many of his novels. And in a way, the process of psychogeography in the derive is to undertake a similar inversion, to start regarding environments as sites of repression that need to be unlocked in some way or other. Uh, the colleague I teach, uh, the course at Brunel, at Nick Papadimitriou, uh, is a believer in what he calls deep topography as an offshoot from psychogeography. And this is the idea that there are actual kind of wellsprings of collective memory, a kind of, you know, interlinkage between the Jungian collective uh, unconscious and the environment such that, you know, a particular manhole cover or electricity substation or granolithic post is in fact a wellspring that you can unlock and you can tap in to these uh, collective memories. Or indeed, you can think about another psychogeographer, though he doesn't like the term applied to him, such as Ian Sinclair, whose books take the form of uh, a recorded and reenacted literary derive, and in which he himself believes that he is being driven hither and thither by magical currents, such as ley lines, for example, that run beneath our ordinary perception of the environments through which we move. Listen, 
I'm not opposed to any of these mystical or occultist ideas, but actually, in terms of the primary act of the derive, the primary act of trying simply to move through environments on a random basis, they seem to me really obvious stratagems rather than actually containing any sort of metaphysical ideas. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.